Hallelujah. Boy, coming to church for any one of these things is just fantastic. And I, I love every part of this service. It has been so great. But this is Baby Sunday, so we're going to invite Annie Lee Green and her parents. If she'd bring her parents up here, I'd really appreciate it. Annie uh, Lee Green is uh, fairly new to our midst. She was born in High River, Alberta, January 29. That's not that long ago. <laughs> and uh, she was born seven pounds. How much is she now? Eleven. Eleven pounds. We're doing good. Way to go, Mom. That's fantastic. This is... Uh, the Leightons, this is Dave, I mean, I'm sorry, I got it wrong, Brooke, and oh, why am I doing this, Leighton? I, I, Leighton is quite famous, if you don't know him yet, you need to meet him afterwards. <laughs> and I'm sure that as all things go, that uh, little Annie will become more famous than her parents, because that's the way it always happens as they grow up. But uh, this family uh, came to us and said, we want to dedicate our child to God. And I couldn't think of a better thing to do. And later on, this is the sermon illustration of all time for me for what I'm about to share with you this morning. It is my greatest honor to introduce the newest member of our church family, Annie Lee Green, and the daughter of Leighton and Brooke. And uh, these parents have come today to pledge themselves before God in this congregation to raise a child in a way that honors the Lord. And they're going to make a bow, and they'll say, I do, just like you did at your wedding. And then I'm going to give you a charge as a congregation, because a child needs all of you <laughs> to grow up in the things of God. Any of you been parents? <laughs> did you ever need help? Well, that's what church is. I, I brought my granddaughters this morning, and they're already back in the Sunday school having a great time. They couldn't wait to get to church because they knew they would be surrounded by people who loved them. And we want every child to know that when they arrive here. So the promise uh, that we're asking these parents to make <coughs> is simply this. Do you, Leighton and Brooke, here today, Dedicate your child to God and commit yourselves to bring little Annie up in the nurturing and admission of the Lord, if so, just say, we do. Do you pledge yourself as parents to live before her godly lives that will leave no stumbling block before this child, if so, say, we do. Excellent. Do you promise to do all in your power to bring this child into a saving faith in Jesus Christ? And finally, do you covenant with God to read the scriptures together, to pray together, and to attend services in the house of God? We do. Amen. She's so at peace. <laughs> well, this is your turn, congregation, to make a promise to little Annie. As members of the body of Christ and the family of God, will you promise to do all in your power to assist these brave parents and their covenant by praying for Annie Lee Green and living ex extraordinary lives before her, the, her? And if so, will you stand with us as we pray and say, we do? We do. Would you stand with us? Let us pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for little Annie. We thank you for your hand upon her. We thank you for her journey to this moment. And, Lord, it is with the prayers of the parents, the prayers that I offer as a minister of the gospel and the prayers of this congregation that we place her solidly in her hands. We pray, Lord, that she would grow up to realize what she was createdly crafted for. She would discover her purpose in this world and that she would know nothing but love and tenderness of God around her through the glory of creation, through the wonder of her parents, and the strong support of this congregation. We pray for strength and health for her, that you would go before her. We pray that you would assist and protect, but not keep her too safe. Just be there to keep her from harm, but allow her to grow and to know 
that her God is a mighty God and can do all things. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you too. Thank you all. Congratulations. You may be seated. I'm going to forget to do this if I don't do it now. I get busy at the end of the service. Let me give you that. Oh, goodness. All right. Well, the ushers are signaling, so we're going to do a quick offering, all right? I'm going to ask the ushers to receive our tithes and offerings this morning. I so appreciate your support uh, for this congregation, the work and ministry of our church. You have been amazing for us allowing us to do some remodeling and new work around the church. Volunteers that came out as well to help that happen, we just so appreciate it. Would you, uh, their scripture offering comes from Luke 12, verse 15. It says, and Jesus said to them, take care and be on your guard at being covetous for one's life that does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Almighty God, we give back to you a portion of what you have given to us. And Lord, we know you're a good father. You give good gifts to your children. And as we give back to you, Lord, we give it as an investment in your kingdom, expression of gratefulness on our part, and an expression of faith in what you are about to do in our life, that there is still goodness to come for us, for our children, for our grandchildren, and for all the world. Lord, let your blessings flow, even as these gifts flow. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Oh, I can't tell you how grateful I am to all of you for your faithful giving, both in time and efforts, in witnessing to other people and sharing the gospel, giving time to God as you pray and you lift the Lord up in your prayers uh, and your family members. Whew. I think I'm supposed to preach. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to get into Genesis chapter 22, if you're wondering where I'm going, verses 1 through 18. Genesis 22, 1 through 18. Some of you know what a Bible looks like. Some of you have tablets. Whatever it is, you can use that. I remember being in a church in Ohio, and uh, I, I, the, I was a young guy, an intern, and it was a large congregation, and I got up to preach, and I gave them that scripture reference, and suddenly everybody whipped out their Bibles, and I heard all these pages turning all over the congregation. It sounded like angel wings all over the congregation, and it was really encouraging to hear. We're going to be continuing our series on the generational call of God. I can't think of a better way to approach this Sunday just dedicating a child. I, I have my children here today. They're over there by Paul Grandma, who's holding a little grandchild. And I have two other grandkids back there taking over Sunday school or whatever. And, well, Ellie. If you haven't met Ellie yet, you will. She will greet you at the cake table and tell you all about herself. She's five. Or almost six, right? And... Uh, I thought about having Ellie come up here and preach. <laughs> she can preach at, at, at five, and she would lay it on you. And I'm sure she, you would remember it better than what you're about to hear, but uh, I hope you get to meet her. Today I want to talk because uh, what I'm experiencing here today with my family, what we've just have accomplished with dedicating this child, what many of you have known, because I know some of your stories, where you, after many years you're beginning to see your families return to God. And you wondered if they ever could. But God, and some of you are still praying, I wonder if my kids will ever come back to God. Don't give up, they do. The generation call of God is a powerful, mighty thing, and I want to talk about that today. But this call that begins, always begins, as we mentioned last time, is you need to answer the call of Jesus Christ on your life personally, first and foremost. Because when you answer the call that God has on your life, you begin to discover what you were created to be and to become. There was a purpose for your creation. You were crafted very carefully by God for a purpose in his kingdom. And it isn't uh, the agenda your parents had or anyone else or your boss or anyone else, even your own agenda. God has his own agenda for your life. 
and he will move heaven and earth to make sure you find out what it is. God wants you to answer the call that he has on your life. Everything, the good and bad of your life, all of that will make sense when you answer the call of Jesus Christ and say, okay, I'm in. A Christian, a one who says, I repent of the past and I want to move into God's future for me, says, I will follow Jesus Christ. That's why we call Christians followers of Jesus Christ. We follow him because he's going to lead us individually into the call that Jesus Christ has on your life. That is why God revealed to us in my last message. You want to know more about that? Go back and check it. Many of you have answered the daily call of Jesus Christ upon your life. Some are making a first-time commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're so thrilled about that, to follow Jesus. And others are renewing their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ because they've known that call and they've gotten distracted by so many other things going in their life, things they thought they were important, only to realize, man, I need to get back to the call of Jesus Christ on my life. As a pastor, I must tell you, it is thrilling to see what a change comes into people's lives when they answer the call of God upon their lives. And don't worry about it. He may not be calling you to be up here. He may be calling you to be a pastor. Who knows? He may be calling you to do all kinds of things, but it might be just to be kind to your spouse. That's a calling, too. It might be be kind to a stranger you meet along the way. That answering the daily call of Christ is one of the most important things you could ever do. But I truly believe, as we answer the call of Christ daily, that things start evolving. We begin to realize things, and I believe that in our midst today, God is calling some of us to be pastors, some of us to be evangelists, some of us to be missionaries, some of us, God bless you, Sunday school teachers. Some of you just to work and labor, swing a hammer, build a building, do whatever it is. There are future leaders in our midst, leaders we desperately need in government, in economics. Do we need any godly wisdom in economics nowadays? Well, where do you get those people? They come when God calls them to it. God gives wisdom in economics, in politics, in war, and conflicts. He knows how to bring about peace and prosperity. We don't. We don't know what we're doing apart from the wisdom of God. And he is calling some of us to these tasks. Some are being called to be doctors and lawyers and even engineers. I don't know why, but yes, he calls us to many professions. It was Martin Luther years ago that says that calling of God to these things, I was made to be this, was called a vocation, which meant the calling of God. If God calls you to be a farmer, God bless you. That's one notch above a pastor. And that has to be a calling. I've, I've worked on dairy farms. You've got to be called to work on a dairy farm. As you step out and you answer the call of God, you discover what it is day by day. And all that we do, all that our lives is, are defined daily by answering that call of Christ. Christ is calling us to follow. And discovering what that following is is a step-by-step -step process. There, I've been asked this week, uh, Pastor, how did you know that you were being called to be a pastor? And it was a step-by-step -step process. I found myself just sharing the love of God with other people, encouraging people in high school not to give up, and trying to explain the Bible to high school students, and they started calling me Pastor John. And that was my nickname. And it was just who I was. And you discover who you are and what you're called to do by how other people identify you. They say, you know what? God used you. God used you. When you hear that, that's God's echoing call on your life. It's not something you define for yourself. It's something that just comes out of you naturally as you follow God step by step. The more you follow God, 
and Jesus Christ calling, the more will follow. The more you follow God, the more of God will follow. And the more you will discover, you'll move from revelation to revelation. You must first answer the call of Jesus Christ. You've got to do what Abraham did and say, here am I, where are we going? I am on my way with you. And he said, I'll show you, I won't tell you. I hate that. Do you have a spouse that uh, gives you directions and you say, what are the next three moves? And you say, I will tell you when it's time. When I won't tell you ahead of time. And so you have to trust that navigator beside you. And that's the way it was with Abraham. He said, go to a country you've never been to before. You don't know where it is. I would just tell you day by day where to go. You will see that throughout the scriptures. You'll see it where he says, now turn right, now turn left, now go here, stop here. Now move, don't stop, now move. The children in the wilderness did that for 40 years. Stop and go. It's a game kids play where they follow the pillar and the fire and the cloud and fire, and they followed God every day. They learned to follow. And you need to follow daily, too, to learn where God is leading you carefully, step by step. It's in the journey and the following uh, that you discover what is next and more fully the call on your life. You have a call on your life. He's got something he wants you to do. And I, I made that wrong because he, he didn't want something. He's got a whole lot of things to do, a long list, but he's not going to give it to you all at once. He's just going to give you a short list each day and said, today let's do this. And you will wonder, if I mess up, am I going to be any good at this? Can I do that? It doesn't matter. It's not about whether you're good. It's about whether you're following One of the things we'll see throughout the scriptures is the followers of Christ often mess up. And then they insisted to have their mess ups put in the Bible. So all you could know how they messed up. Because God uses the mess ups to do his mighty work. He wants to use you too. And he has promised to do that very thing. As you follow Jesus Christ daily, you will begin to see a pattern developing in your life and where Jesus Christ appears to be leading you. I didn't say seem to be leading you. I said appears to be leading you. As you follow, he appears before you and said, this way, come this way. And you'll become more and more discerning as you follow. Your first steps will always be awkward, but as you launch out, it will get clear. That is the first call, the call to follow that Abraham answered. And now we're going to look at the calling that follows that first call. It is the second revelation of the generational call in your life. The second revelation comes by testing. That is where you pick up the Bible's historic account of Abraham. We're going to find it in Genesis 22, 1 through 18. Verses 1 and 2, our our passage today says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to Abraham, Abraham, here am I, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him. There on a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Every relationship, every relationship, if it is to grow stronger, must be tested. It, if it is to grow stronger, it must be tested. The relationship that has faced doubt, your relationships that have faced difficulty and discouragement, And all that serves to make that relationship stronger, resilient, and more powerful in many ways. Too many who have answered the first call of God to follow, to follow Christ into salvation, are based on the idea that if they accept Jesus Christ, that God will make their lives comfortable, blessed, and free of worry and difficulties. That's why I'm giving my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to live on easy street, and Jesus is going to do it for me. 
I just want out of all my troubles. I believe that many people think that if they give their hearts to Jesus Christ, that Jesus will power them and shower them with health, money, and promotions. That is not how you grow in a relationship with Jesus Christ. The key to a stronger relationship with anyone, but especially with Jesus Christ, is not in getting promises from God or making sure that he delivers what he has promised. That kind of idea is what we called entitled. So there are people who say, I want the title of being a child of God, and with that title, I'm entitled to certain privileges and wealth and prosperity. And that is not a healthy relationship. That is not how it grows. We don't get uh, perks and kickbacks from God just because we're a child of God. If we don't get those perks, you know if you're titled when you think you are being cheated by God. Have you ever thought that or felt that? God's not being fair. Any of you middle children here, middle children? Everything has to be fair if you're a middle child. Everyone's got to be even. And if you think someone's got an easier life than you and you have a hard life, you think, God is not fair. I'm done following him. I've met people who have stopped following God for that very reason. Because they thought that it was all about fairness. It's not. God is interested in a relationship with you. And that is by testing in our life. We said some words and we gave our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ while expecting a comfortable, stress-free life. And after we answered the call of God, we have met people who have been told they they stopped following Jesus Christ because Christ did not follow through on his promises. And like Abraham, their relationship was tested. Unlike Abraham, they failed the test. They did not decide to trust God despite the testing in their life. The first call of Christ is to follow. The second is to remain faithful to that answer, to follow God no matter what. The first one is about faith, follow God in faith. The second calling is about trusting. There's only one question that really matters when you go into the testing phase of your calling, and it's this. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? And your answer, if you're a human being here today, I think most of you are human beings here today, will be, yes, I trust you, sort of, (laughs) kind of. And you won't know how far your trust is until you are tested. We are all on this journey together. We all start this journey in faith to follow him, but we are tested. We say that we trust Jesus Christ, but do we really? Do we really trust him? The only way is to be tested in our following. Because God has given us a faith that it dwells in us. Faith comes by the hearing of the word of God, but it also is a gift to God that he places in us where we hear what God has promised, say, I will do this for you if you would believe in me. And then when we in and of ourselves says, I will listen to the Holy Spirit, I will trust him with my personal stuff, then we unleash what God can do in our life. Jesus Christ equips you to trust him if you will make that choice. If you answer the first call of Christ to follow You right now have the power and the faith and the ability to answer the second question, do you trust me? You have the ability to say, yes, I do. God, help me. Yes, I do. I will follow you. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, these important words, no temptation. And I'm going to stop there because many translations, as the NFA says, temptation. But there are many scholars who argue that that word should be translated test rather than temptation. Do temptations ever test you? I I just recently received a gift of Walker's shortbread cookies. 
do I look like I need more cookies in my life? Do I? God bless you for that. No, I don't need more cookies. And I want you to know they are sitting unopened for over a week now. I have been tested. I don't know why people test me in this way. But there is no temptation or test that has overtaken you except that what is common to mankind, everyone is tested. That's how we go, grow in our relationship with God. And it is God, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted or tested. He's not going to test me beyond what I can bear. He knows what I can take. He knows what the upper limit of my stress levels are. But when you are tempted or tested, he will provide a way out so you can endure it. Now, I'm looking around the room, and I think I'm seeing a whole lot of bodybuilders here. You're looking healthy and trim. You're looking around, who's he talking about? <laughs> so I've, I've talked to the guys who are fairly healthy. I did this week, and they, uh, they were talking about how to build muscles. Not that I know much about it, but I guess they're supposed to be about a stress test where you lift a weight, and your muscles get used to lifting that weight, and you don't stay there, you have to add more weight later on. And then you lift that, and then you add a little more as you go through. And those are tests or stress tests that build up over time. And as you do it, you get stronger and stronger and stronger, theoretically. But if you put too much weights on there and you try to lift it, you rip a ligament or something like that, you're not stronger, you're weaker. So you've got to know with the limits how much weights to put on there. I want you to think of that passage in this way. God wants you stronger in your faith, which he has given you to learn to trust in it. But unless you're tested, you don't know how much you can trust God. How much can you trust God? With what could you trust God? I've warned people not to say everything because you don't mean it. But when you're broke and you're not sure if you can pay for your next bill, do you trust God then for the next bill? When you have cancer and you don't know if you'll survive it, do you trust God for what comes next? Someday, I am getting older, I will be at death's door. I will pass from this world into the next. Will I trust God then? Someday, I will have a grandchild come to me who's a teenager. I can't even imagine that. And they might test me, will I trust God for those grandchildren when they become teenagers? There will be an election that will come up in your life, a federal election, I bet more than one. Will you trust God then? There will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be conflicts and all kinds of things going on. People warning you of economic doom. But will you trust God then with those particulars in your life? Will you trust him to show you where to go, what to do, and how to do it, and give you the power and the authority by faith to do those very things? With each stress test, you will grow stronger if you trust him. If you follow him, Jesus Christ will incrementally increase the stress test in your life as you grow stronger. You move from victory to victory by answering the call of Christ and the test of your faith. Abraham was asked to surrender the one thing, the one thing he really wanted from God. Because following God by faith requires surrender. He was asked to give up his son. He was, his son was asked to trust God speaking through Abraham despite his father's faith and to find his own reason to trust God. This test was not just of Abraham. It was a test of Isaac too. We believe in this part of the story. Isaac is not a baby being brought forward for a child dedication. He was a grown adult by this time, and Abraham is pushing long in his years. Genesis 22, verse 3 on down to 8. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, and he loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And 
when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. Have, have you ever considered uh, a son of yours, a boy, even though he's 20 years old? Are, are some of you now 60 and your dad still calls you boy? <laughs> That's what's going on here. Abraham took the wood and the butter offering and he placed it on his son Isaac. That's how I know Isaac is not a baby. You don't put wood for an offering. I've seen how much wood that is on a baby. You put it on the back of a strong young man, right? So he put it on the back of Isaac and he himself carried uh, the fire and the knife. And the two of them went on together, and Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb We're for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two went on their way together. Abraham really had no idea what was about to take place. He just knew he had to give his most precious son, the one thing, the most important person in all the world in his life, to God. And he knew that he needed to do it, but he didn't know how this would take place. He turned to his uh, helpers there, his servants, in verse 5, and he said, we will worship, and then we will come back. Abraham is already saying there, I'm, we're going to go there and we're going to come back together. That's what Abraham believed. He, he didn't know what would happen. Some scholars argued he thought maybe Jesus or God will allow, resurrect my sacrificed son and we'll both come back. I don't know what's going to happen. But he was being tested in the I don't know. He believed in God's goodness. He believed in God's faithfulness. He says, I don't understand why we're doing this. It doesn't make any sense to me. But if God says do it, I will do it. That's what it means to trust God, to follow him. The sense of it comes afterwards. Abraham answered the call and said, here am I. And he said, uh, basically, here we are with Isaac. And Isaac is needing to trust the God of Abraham. One of the greatest challenges we ever have in our life is if we have a faith in God is to pass it on to our children and to our grandchildren. It's a task we all have, even to pass it on to a younger generation around you. My son was in the Air Force, and he was an old man at 30, and he was dealing with 18-year-olds coming in, and they were asking him for advice. They weren't his kids, but they were asking about God and family life, and he was happy to share with him. There are younger generations around you that need the generational call of Christ in their lives too, and how are they going to get it unless you take the patriarch position and teach them and guide them and tell them about the things of God. You can trust God. Give it to him. He'll pull you through. Isaac needed this lesson if he was going to receive the promise and the covenant of Abraham in his own life and walk by it with all the blessings that came with it, Isaac is being tested as well. The second call of Christ on your life is to help you realize that you have the ability to sacrifice everything for Jesus Christ. You have that ability. It is not beyond your reach. You can do this. You can give everything to God and hold nothing back. You can do what Christ often called others to do. And just to prove my point, I brought it up. Matthew 19, 21. Jesus answered the rich ruler. He said, if you want to be perfect, if you really want to follow me, sell your possessions. Give it to the poor. And you will have a treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. Mark 10, 29 to 31. Truly I tell you, Jesus says. Truly I tell you, is a, this is it. This is the core, right? 
No one has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much. In this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last shall be first. Jesus go on to say to his disciples, Matthew 16, 24 to 26, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If you want to know who you are, why you were created, what's your purpose in life, you find it by following. You discover, oh, that's why I'm so short or so tall, why I have this face, why I have this personality that nobody likes. It's because I was designed this way for a purpose that it would not have worked in any other way. Follow Jesus daily. You'll discover what it is. And you, the big part of the testing is, are you holding anything back? Or is it all his? The second call of Christ sounds like this. Do you trust me? I'll add one other line to it. With everything. Do you trust me with absolutely everything? Wow. Wow. We answer by saying yes, and then doing the hard thing, trusting Jesus Christ by faith to work out everything for our good. This is a stress test that will increase our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we can do even greater things beyond our ability when we give everything to him. Abraham answered this test by God by saying, yes, yes, I trust you. I will do as you ask. I I will follow you. Abraham believed that even this strange request would work out for good. If it sounded disastrous, he still trusted God in his promise. He tells his servants he's coming back with Isaac. He doesn't know how. You have the same faith and even greater faith than Abraham. You have it. It's in you. It's there with the Holy Spirit to trust God in everything. You just haven't exercised that muscle enough. Stress trusting him with little things and then begin to trust him with the big things and then trust him with everything. It's going to take time for you to get there. I believe you can do it. I really do. I know this because... People tell me of their victories. They come running up to me after the service and say, do you know what God did with me this week? I say, that's amazing. Isn't that awesome? And I chuckle. You know why I chuckle? Because as great as that is, if you pass that test, God's got a harder one coming. No matter what it was. Because that's just the way God is. We just think, it can't get any better. And I chuckle because it can. It can get better, stronger, healthier with the Lord Jesus Christ. You have this same faith when you answer that first call of Jesus Christ in your life, Savior and Lord of your life. You can know the blessings of God moving in everything he has called you to trust him for. Because God has given you faith. He's placed it in you through the Holy Spirit, entering your spirit when you first answered the call of Jesus Christ to follow him. Jesus Christ equips everyone who follows him with the ability to follow. It gives you God-given gift of faith. The powerful gift of God is inside of you. And every believer through the presence of the Holy Spirit, we don't know what the gift of faith until we are tested and we got to count on it when we don't know if it's there, only to discover, man, it's really there. I can trust God. We must rely on it as we follow Jesus Christ, even into greater steps, greater challenges of faith 
that leads us to become more and more reliant, more and more reliant on His power, His wisdom, His grace. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13 says this, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. You can bear this journey. You can come through. Abraham did, you can. You have the same faith. You have the same calling in your life. I believe there are many here today who have not answered the call of Christ to follow him by repenting of their old life and their old plans and their old ideas and their old notions. And you need to move away from those plans and into answering the call of Christ. Discover what you were created for. I also believe many of us have answered that first call of Christ, and I, I know many of you have. But to, to follow through in that first call is really important, to take the test and say, I will trust God with this as well. The reason we have not followed through in our first calling is because we have said, no. We don't say, like Abraham, yes. We say, no, I won't do that. And we quelch the second calling in Revelation, the testing of faith in our life. We say no to the second calling of Christ when we say, no, I won't tithe. I'm not going to give you 10%. Government's taking too much already. I'm only going to give you a little bit when I can afford it. We say no when they say, no, I won't witness to that person. They will reject me. They won't like me. I want to get along with them, and they're not going to like it. I might even get fired. No, I won't trust God for my healing because I don't believe God cares enough to heal a little old me. I won't even ask. No, I won't ask God for guidance because I don't believe God will speak to me or show me which way I'll go or what I ought to do. Why would he care? No, I won't surrender all to Jesus Christ because I don't trust him. That's what it comes down to. You can dress it up any way you want. That's what it really is. Do you trust him? We say we follow by faith, but do we really trust him by faith? Abraham did. He went up the mountain. Isaac did. He went up the mountain with Abraham. <laughs> then, after that climb up that mountain, after the, the test of faith, they realized... Do you know that he claimed, climbed the same kind of mountain that Jesus Christ claimed up to Golgotha, carrying a cross? Abraham was asked to give up his son, and because of what Abraham did, God was willing to give up his son, Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you a great truth I learned long ago from an old preacher. He told me this many years ago, and I was challenged by faith to believe what he said, and he said this to me, John, you can never outgive God. And he repeated it to me so I'd understand what I said. He said to me, he said, John, you can never outgive God. Then he said a third to me, I dare you to outgive God. And I took him up on his challenge. I'm here to tell you today, you cannot outgive God. You cannot do it. Abraham was willing to give up his son Isaac. God will not be outgiving. He gave his son on Golgotha for you. He said, don't, don't kill Isaac. I know you're giving him to me, and I love you for it, but don't kill him. But because you were willing, I am willing. Because you were willing to give your son, I am willing to give mine. Because you're willing to give your life, I'm willing to give my life for you. God will not be outgiving. A sacrifice, when God asks you to give back to him what he has given to you, is a challenge of your test. Here's the other great revelation. It is a test of God, too. Because he will match it tenfold. Whatever you're willing to surrender it was late in life as I began to realize if I want something to be under God's protection, under God's blessing, I'm going to have to give it to him. I've got a car that needs fixing. Any of you have a car like that? I want it fixed. 
I turned to my wife, because she's very wise, and he said, what do I need to do to get my car fixed? And she said, I have to surrender it to mechanic. I don't want to surrender it to mechanic. I'm afraid of mechanics. I'm afraid of how much it's cost or whether it'll be done right. I don't know if I can trust a mechanic. Any of you say amen to that? And yet, there's no moving forward with my car until I do surrendering of my car to a mechanic. Why don't we get this with God? You've got to surrender it. You've got to give it into his hand. And if you do, it will be better. It'll be all right. You can trust God. Why don't we trust him? Why do we hold it back? Why are we so anxious when we are tested and we say, yes, I will trust you, God. God is tested too. When we answer and we say, I will trust God, then God answers that challenge and he will match your faith and go beyond it. This is the journey we're on. Genesis 22, 1 through 18, verse 13. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by the horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven the second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this, you have not withheld, he gave everything, you have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of your enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Many of you have come to me over the last year or so and told me how the world is going to hell in a handbasket. And you described everything that you're upset with me about. I have just read to you how God is going to fix it. You will take over the cities of your enemies. And the world will be blessed through you, through the generational call of God upon your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren and descendants as the gift of faith is passed. The reason we get into trouble is we say no to God and we don't trust him. The way we fix it is we say yes to God and then we follow through and we trust him. And the way it really gets fixed is when we hold nothing back. I believe in God because my parents believed and took me to church. I was but a child in my faith. The day came when I came to believe in God to be by my own acts of faith. I established my own relationship with Jesus Christ by answering the first and the second call of God in my life. And this was made possible through my parents who offered me up to God and asked God to lead me into his perfect will. May is a powerful month for me because Mother's Day is coming up. I was born on May 11th, Mother's Day. My dad went to get to the pulpit and never made it. We are off to the hospital together. And the next Sunday I was in church. The call of God has been on my family and on us to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is a call of God in your life. And maybe you're the first generation that will begin the call. As my great grand, my grandfather did on my mother's side, he was a drunk and an alcoholic, but he answered the call of Christ, came to salvation in Jesus Christ, raised a family based on the call of Jesus Christ, did the next thing, did the right thing. And out of his home came preachers and missionaries because a drunk gave his life to God. You may be that first generation of many generations to come. You may know this song. Please don't laugh at me when I share this with you. You're going to laugh at me. Wailing Jennings, Willie Nelson, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. <laughs> See, I told you. You laughed. Don't let them pick 
guitars or drive them old trucks. Let them be doctors and lawyers and such. You're singing the song in your head. I know it. Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys because they'll never stay home and they're always alone, even when someone they love. There's a truth in that song, but I wouldn't call it a church hymn. Don't let your babies grow up playing it safe. Don't let your babies grow up to be smart according to the wisdom of this world. Teach them to trust God. Fully follow him and hold nothing back. Pass on a faith that gives them a better life than the one you know right now. Teach them, show them, share with them faith in Jesus Christ by answering the call of Christ yourself and following him. I want to help you with that second calling of Christ and for the next testing that's coming around your corner. If you think you've been tested, hang on, another one's on the way. And you will need strength to face the next test. And here's my best advice I can ever give. I've already told you what it is. Hold nothing back. Give it all. Whatever, whenever, whoever God asks you to give to him, give it by faith to God. Hold nothing back for the testing of faith in Jesus Christ. You have faith in you. You can do this. You can give Whatever God is asking you to give, you can do it. You really do need to do it. You don't just need to think about it, have good intentions. You need to follow through when God asks. You will fail if you hold on to what you have. You will succeed when you surrender it all. You will pass your next test if you surrender what he asks you to give and you give it joyfully to him to look for results, to look for conditions from God, to get bargains and assurance and guarantees and something in writing will make you fail. Just trust him. You can trust him. Just give Jesus what he asks and hold nothing back. I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking. I believe that someone right now is about to be tested and you've been given a test in your life you're being asked to surrender something and you've been holding it back and so I don't want to give that. But God is asking you to surrender it so you can use it, so you can bless it, so you can discover the next thing. By giving it to him, you will find something even more precious in your life. Only now are you realizing the thing you're holding on to, the thing you're holding on to and not surrendering is the thing that's controlling you. And it's not God whatever that thing is. The realization that surrender is your only way out, is your only way forward to freedom and faith is dawning on your life. Fear will hold you back from the mountain of God where you will find what you need for the mountain says God will provide. But you've got to climb the mountain. You've got to be willing to surrender. And as you do, you will discover what Abraham knew. Why not surrender it? on the altar of God. Why not give it to him and see that you can trust God? Why not give it a shot? Why not give it all to him? I couldn't think of a better person, a better one to be trusted that millions and billions have for thousands of years, only to echo what Abraham knew. God will provide. He is always faithful. Would you stand with me for just a moment? Lord, we have heard your word and we stand before you with our heads bowed. And on every heart, I believe there is a challenge upon our lives. A challenge to trust you above all things and not to lean on our own wisdom and understanding. And you have placed before us something that we can't deny. There is something that we have not given to you. Lord, I don't know what it is. It might be a common thing. It might not be a common thing. But right now, we are on the mountain of the Lord. We are before you, and we want to surrender it. And right now, we get to put that to action. 
If you're here today with your head bowed and your eyes closed and there is something on your heart that God wants you to surrender, I want you to put one hand in the air and hold it up and leave it up there before God. Don't take it down. Leave it up. Leave it up. Whatever that is, whatever God is asking you to surrender, it's surrender it right now and say, Lord, I give it to you. It is yours. It is not mine. I will not hold this back one more day, not one more minute. On the mountain of the Lord, we stand before you, Lord, with this sacrifice, the one you've asked us to give, and we give it to you, Lord. It's all yours. Do with it as you may. For good, bad, we don't care, Lord. Whatever your plans are, that's the one we want for the thing we're surrendering by lifting your hands. If it on your mind there is that thing that you are not lifting your hand, you say, man, I wish that were true. Lift your hand right now. Surrender it to him. Give it to him. Let him touch that. Oh, God, I know you're looking on these outstretched hands that are surrendering, and you are pleased, and you want to bless that, heal that, resurrect it, and do amazing things. We know, Lord, nothing is beyond your ability to do, even beyond the grave, even over great miles and distances, even over great threats, Lord, you are able. You will provide. I pray, oh, God, that you would reach back to every outstretched hand and touch them and say, I will take that from you and I will give you something far better. Oh, God of Abraham, we thank you for meeting us on the mountain of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling
down before Him, for He is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. cross as you wait for your crown. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says this, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We thank you, Lord, for the miracles that are to follow the surrender. We thank you for the wonders that you are worthy of praise. We thank you for every life that has reached out for you and we thank you, Lord, for every touch that is returned by your mighty hand in their lives. Lord, bless it all to your glory. May we hear testimonies about how good God is, how he can be trusted, and how lovely it is to walk by faith with him. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. If you're new to our congregation want to communicate to us, just fill out this card. We'd love to hear from you. And I see Glenn sneaking up here. Are you coming up here for a reason? All right. You can be seated. Uh, as you have heard, I was asked to make a short five minute uh, to cover that. On behalf of Millerville Church, it's a pleasure to co congratulate Pastor John and Sandra as they celebrate their 40th anniversary in, in ministry and leadership. I recall his first message at MCC. It was entitled, War is Coming and You Are the Targets. <laughs> that sermon resulted in a unanimous vote to call Pastor John to the minister of mobil, uh, mobilization at MCC. I don't recommend that you start <laughs> your pastorate in a church by that message, but it proved to be prophetic. I commend you for your outstanding leadership and community outreach to the ministries that have impacted so many lives here in Canada and in the U.S., we extend our sincere appreciation to you both and your family for your excellence of ministry and for your important contributions. Our congregation certainly has benefited from your history of faithfulness to God and a legacy of inspirational preaching along with 40 years of teaching. We thank you for being a critical part of our faith journey here at, in this community. You've been here with us five years, and may God continue to bless you both as you continue to serve this community and this body. Please join us for a cake and coffee after this service. I'd like to call on Vicki King.
Ms. Vicki here, and Justine Grant for a presentation. We'll ask John and Sandra to come up. <laughs> Vicki is one of the elders here at the church, and Justine is a new uh, attendee, and she's a, an accomplished artist. So, Vicki? Thank you, Glenn. We're going to start with Justine because she's done something very special today. We asked her to make a card for you, but she even went beyond that. So, if you could present that, please. Can you hold it up for the congregation here? Wow. <laughs> Show your face, love. <laughs> Thank you, Justine. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. These flowers are smelling so nice. I hate to give them up. <laughs> as, we, as we look at you two, um, our dear Sandra, we thank you for, we recognize as a church, your contribution to standing beside this man. <laughs> for 40 years. What a team. <laughs> what a team. And we also thank Megan because we know it's not easy being a PK, a preacher's kid. <laughs> So would you please extend to your brothers our thanks for sharing your parents with so many congregations over the years. We also, um, so Sandra, that's for you, my dear. Um, it also struck me this morning that of all the places in all the world that the Lord could have chosen to have John and Sandra, Pastor John and Sandra B is here at our own church. And what a privilege it is to have this occasion happening in this community. Now, <laughs> now for you. <laughs> uh, Pastor John, I remember the, one of the first sermons you, you said, performed for, performed, said for us, preached for us. You said, if you want me to be your pastor, call me Pastor John. If you want me to be your friend, call me John. <laughs> so sometimes I forget when I'm in church that I should be calling you Pastor John. Oh, right. But anyway, we appreciate your knowledge. We appreciate in this community your understanding we appreciate your wisdom. And we just want to say a blessing over both of you and your willingness to follow the way of the Lord. And you are steadfast in that, for sure. Um, so a blessing for you too is that every petal in that bouquet will be a blessing for you in the future. Oh, nice. And every stem of flowers and that bouquet will be a thank you from the community for what you have done for us. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>